welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. This is episode 51. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. We've got two feature interviews for you today. Yes. There's been a lot of discussion and footage on YouTube and social media about the Edinburgh Yarn Festival over the last few weeks, but I thought many of you may not know much about the founders of the festival. You might actually be thinking that it's been all organised by a large Scottish event managing company. Well, it's not. Its success is solely due to two passionate Edinburgh knitters who decided off their own back that they just wanted to create their dream yarn festival. So the first interview is with um, Mika and Joe, the founders, and you're going to hear all about their story. And then our second interview features Kate Atherley, who is Nitty's technical editor and author of Custom Socks and pattern writing for knit designers and these two books are topics that a lot of people are interested in and Kate loves to delve in really deeply and solve a whole lot of annoying problems for knitters so hopefully you'll find that really interesting and helpful. Yeah definitely something to learn in yeah. that interview. Um, we are going to be taking a hike to a very well preserved 13th century castle uh, Andrea is going to be giving us a comparison of traditional and modern ferrile patterning and we also have two two finished objects to celebrate. So we're yes. going to start off with bring and brag. With me. So I finished my Sam Free by Marie Wallen. <laughs> Yay. Yay. I'm so happy. It's I love it. It fits very well and I'm going to very quickly just go over the, the modifications that I, I made. The pattern is written flat and in my opinion there's absolutely no benefit to knitting this pattern in the flat because the repeats are really long and impossible to memorize really and to be purling every second row in Fair Isle would to me be a nightmare so it was very easy to convert it into the round which I did and I knitted it up to the armholes but then I found that it was really big and it was quite baggy and it was bagging over the one by one rib so I had to uh, rip it right back to the ribbing and my gauge by the way was absolutely perfect with the 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 pattern That's extraordinary. It is so it was it wasn't to do with my gauge at all I ripped it right back to the patterning and I took out a full 10 centimeters from down here and Then I had to slowly increase back up to the written stitch count just before the armholes So that this section here would be wide enough for it to be a drop shoulder so I did that and then I steaked the armholes and the shoulders have also got some shaping on them. So normally what I would do there is just do those last few rows in the flat. That means purling every second row in, in the ferrule. But that's not a problem because it's only a short bit. But this time I experimented with shaping shoulders in the round using short rows. And I just uh, showed you how I did that back in episode 49. So... It's finished now. I'm really happy with it. I love the shape of the neck. You can see it's it's quite high and wide, and I think that looks really good. The yarn is the Jamieson uh, Jamiesons of Shetland jumper yarn, and it's it's a great yarn. I can do this all day long, and it won't peel. Don't do that all day long, <laughs> girls. Please. Which which I love because I want to wear this garment every day with jeans or a skirt and know that in five years' time it's just still going to look so good. Yeah, and when Andrea says every day, that's exactly what she means. Yes. This is one of the <laughs> few cases where you can say literally and it really means literally. Yeah. Whenever I, I complete something, I usually wear it every day, at least for yeah. the next two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's my first finished object. Yeah. I think it's super, super elegant too. I really like the neck. Yeah. That's my favorite bit. And I particularly like it when you're wearing it without a collar. Though. Yes. Yeah. Because you've got the jumper neck and you've also got your beautiful neck. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll move on. This is my second finished object and I love Yay. it. It's a tan that's taken out of the Vintage Shetland Project book by Susan Crawford and we interviewed Susan about the amazing research that she did for this project book. Uh, back in episode 48. So if you haven't seen it, you've got to see that interview. It's it's one of the best, I reckon. And so it was a lot of fun to take um, this tam out of the book and to knit it up. You can use her Exelana or Fenella yarn, or you can use Jamison and Smith. I've used the Jamison and Smith. The hat comes in three different sizes. The model was wearing the largest size, so I just went for the largest size. And the gauge for this hat is 35 stitches and 36 rows. Well, I got down to 33 
stitches and 36 rows on 2.25 millimeter needles. So I'm a little bit looser, but nevertheless, it's still a very small gauge. And although it takes a long time to knit at such a small gauge, the texture produces such a beautiful, it's such a, such a beautiful vintage quality to it. It almost looks machine knit to me. So I totally love it. The colors are very traditional Shetland Fair Isle with the, the blue, the red and the gold on a, a, a natural background. Um, let me try it on and show you what it looks like. And it's called, Andrew has to tell you. because yeah, right. It's Twagios. It, we don't know how to pronounce it, but that's what it looks like. And this is an old Norse name and it means two ravines. The Twa, I think, is two and Gios is the ravine. And it's a sort of Shetland word. Yeah, so there we go. Yep, it's really cute. It's gorgeous. I love it. I normally don't like knitting accessories, but I totally enjoyed knitting this design because it's very special. It's got a, a lovely vintage feel about it. It's classical. It, yeah, but it's, it's beautiful. Yep. I want to quickly tell you a little bit about the modifications that I made, and I'll keep it very quick. You start, the most important thing about the hat is making sure that the brim fits because it's in fair isle and it's got facing, so it's double thickness. There's not a lot of elasticity to it, so you have to make sure that that fits you. Um, you st in the pattern, it starts here and you knit in fair isle and then you turn it inside out and you do the facing in stocking stitch. But the way the pattern's reading uh, is, is written, in the end, your facing will have the pearl side turned outwards. I wanted the knit side to be showing, so I did mine a little bit differently. Going back to the way the pattern's written, you have the pearl side here, then you continue to knit the body of the, of the hat and at the end you turn the brim up and you hand sew it down. So the changes that I made are like this and you might follow, maybe not, don't worry if you, if you can't, I'll just make it brief. <laughs> I start here, I fair uh the brim, I do one row of pearl, which is my turning row. So if you can imagine there, I start here, I, I fair isle the brim, I do one row of pearl, which is my turning row. I continue on in stocking stitch so that the knit side is going to be facing on, on the facing. And then when I come to the required length, I knit into, I turn it, I, I turn the brim around and I knit into each one of the original cast on stitches. So therefore I've closed up the brim and joined it already. I then have the inside of my knitting facing me. So I just turn it inside out, which is the right side, ends up being the right side and I knit the hat. So that's how I did it. And I think I understood that. Good. <laughs> You're improving. I'm probably wrong. But. <laughs> okay, so there we go. It was a really great experience to be able to knit this jumper here, which I consider to be a modern fair isle design, back to back with this hat, which is a very traditional Shetland fair isle design. So I wanted to um, compare the patterning on both of them and talk about it a bit. But first of all, I thought I'll just talk a little bit about or summarize some of the rules of Fair Isle for those of you who may not be too familiar with it. Basically in Fair Isle, you only ever have two colors per row. And the foreground motif color and the background color have to change fairly frequently in one row. So for a Fair Isle pattern, you would usually only have a maximum of about seven stitches in one color before you change to the other color. And that just means that the fabric is gonna have more even thickness all around. So I'm now going to show you close-up pictures of both garments. Fair Isle patterns contain diagonal lines which are especially important in large patterns. The tension is created between the foreground motive yarn and background yarn at the points in the row where the yarns change over. So diagonal lines of colour distribute this tension by varying the changeover points of the yarn from one row to the next and this makes the fabric firm but elastic. So patterns with vertical lines or blocks of colour are way less elastic because the changeover points are just way too consistent. They're always in the same point. And that basically means that um, in, in Fair Isle patterns, vertical lines are kept to a minimum and when they are used, they're broken up after a few rows. Fair Isle patterns usually also have odd number rows and are very symmetrical. 
and they're often based on the OXO and have four lines of symmetry. So they have an exact mirror image when cut in half vertically, cut in half horizontally and cut in half diagonally. And this mirror image makes it easier to memorize. So patterns that have no symmetry um, like Scandinavian bird motifs or flower motifs, they're really beautiful to look at but because of the lack of symmetry they're harder to memorize and therefore they end up being slower to knit. Also in typical feral garments you have alternating large and small bands of patterning which is exactly what this hat has. Large feral pattern bands which on this design is placed around the large part of the hat are worked over 17 to 19 rows and they have six or eight sided oval or, or O shapes and are linked horizontally by crosses and you can see exactly that right here. Then you have Puri patterns and Puri is a Shetland word meaning small so it's the name given to the smallest patterns which are usually no bigger than seven rows. Puri patterns are used to separate large ferrule pattern bands or used in combination with border pattern bands. You also have seeding which is a very small pattern used as a filler and at first I thought that the red dots might be seeding but I think that they're actually used as a very small one row Puri pattern. Then there's border patterns which are the smaller blue bands on this hat and they have 9 to 15 rows and are also based on the OXO form. The pattern on the brim of the tam and further up on the smaller part of the body of the hat are border patterns. So the design has the large fair isle pattern around the largest part of the hat with border patterns on the smaller parts and that gives it a natural symmetry as the hat gets smaller. And you can also see on this hat that each border pattern and peery pattern is different which is really beautiful. So the colours on the tam are very bold and clear with high contrast between the foreground and the background and the colours on Marie's um, jumper are very muted and heathered with really low contrast between the foreground and motif colors. So it's interesting also to compare this. So I'm going to show you a close-up of Marie's jumper and when I look at Marie's design I roughly see two very big pattern bands each with 38 rows before it repeats but it actually doesn't only have bands. The pattern motif here is an all over tessellated pattern which is repeating continuously in both vertical and horizontal directions. And tessellated patterns are also a very traditional ferrule design. You can view a tessellated pattern as a transposed OXO pattern. I think what's really funny to notice is that if you were to knit Marie's design in bold solid color, uh, colors like this with high contrast, I think the result would be quite gaudy and possibly even ugly. And if you were to knit the tam in Marie's colors of heathered, that are heathered and muted and very low contrast between motif and background, I think this would end up being pretty dull and boring and maybe even a bit frumpish. <laughs> so, but they're both so elegant and beautiful, just the way they yes, are. They are yes. Yeah. So it's it's been a lot of fun to be able to knit them back to back and compare them. So I hope you found that interesting as well. Yep. Um, coming up now is our interview with Joe and Micah, who actually work all year round on the Edinburgh Yarn Festival. This is a really fun opportunity to get to hear their story about how they started up the festival and what their thinking is um, to determine the direction of the festival in future. And there is some interesting stuff there. Yeah. So I um, hope you enjoy this. Yeah. See you afterwards. <laughs> Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. This year is the fifth Edinburgh Yarn Festival. 
It's the UK's number one urban hand knitting show and it's been described as a yarn lover's dream department store. There are around 100 high quality vendors, there's workshops and classes with some great knitting teachers and designers from around the world, as well as some very well organised social events. The Edinburgh Yarn Festival is now a serious destination for passionate knitters from all around the world, but it's not organised by a major industry event manager. It's organised by two passionate Edinburgh knitters who wanted to create their own dream knitting show. Micah Kelmos and Joe Kelly have developed the festival to its present success in just four years, and I think that's an amazing achievement. So I'm really happy to have the chance to talk to them about it on the podcast. So Mika and Joe, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for spending your time with us, especially since it's pre-Edinburgh Yarn Festival and you'd be very busy. We are. We are very busy, yeah. <laughs> we are. Absolutely. We are. We just about to shoot this in. Overwhelmed, I think, but... Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll start by telling us how you both came up with the idea of organising a yarn festival together. And um, did you have a really clear vision of how you wanted the festival to be right from the beginning, or has it just evolved naturally over the years? Okay, well, first of all, um, at the time when we came up with the idea um, in 2012, there was almost nothing um, up here. Or in the UK. Um, Yeah, in the UK, there were very few uh, yarn festivals, full stop. Um, There were a few, you know, uh, tried and tested formulas like Woolfest, which is much more um, agricultural. It's focused on on livestock and spinning and um, all sorts of wool things. Um, And we just, we wanted something here, you know, so we thought, well, we're going to, we're just going to do it. Yeah. We wanted to have something, we we felt there was a gap in the market and we wanted to have a a modern event for knitters like us and that's what we felt was really missing overall in the UK. We've heard of an event called Knit Nation in London, Uh, it was in 2011, it was the year before and that was a a modern event and we thought that's the sort of thing we would really like to see here and uh, we saw the only chance of making it happen by doing it ourselves. That's basically yeah. Yeah. it. was kind of born yeah. out of desperation. It was born we out just, of we yarn wanted desperation. Yarn. <laughs> <laughs> well, just in just four years, the Edinburgh Yarn Festival has really become a prestigious event. And um, like very high quality vendors are excited to be invited. And it's literally attracting visitors from all around the world. So why do you think it's so successful? It's almost, I wouldn't say it's an accident, but we are focusing on what we would like to see. And it's just a happy coincidence that that seems to really string a chord with a lot of people, that there are an awful lot of knitters out there that want modern patterns. They want to see very high quality and high quality exhibitors with luxury yarns and unusual yarns and yarns with a story. And we reckon it's simply a case that because we are, so immersed in that ourselves that's why it it works and that's why it's successful it is and it's like it's a a very very focused environment so if you like yarn this is for you you know that um and like Mika said we are the customer in a way so um it's just entirely focused on the hobby and not on any of the the periphery so how do you divide the work up between you so what do you have individual roles um, it's grown quite organically. So between us, uh, we get that asked quite a lot. And as any small business owner will know, we, you know, uh, there are lots of different things that you need to be doing when you run uh, a business or an event. Joe's uh, really focusing on the teaching program. My sort of passion is the exhibition end of it. I really like logistics and spreadsheets and organizing things. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the rest of it just falls into place Mm -hmm. I would say yeah and we wear all the hats so there are no departments um in this business we are every single department that there is so anything that comes along one of us does it yeah we find the skills to do it yeah Yeah. we have to there's a lot of learning involved so every now and again we come across something that we have to make a decision um do we want to try and learn this or are we going to find a service that's going to do it for us? And nine times out of ten, I would say we do it. We just do it. <laughs> just quicker. Yeah. 
Okay, so apart from vendors, you've got these um, great workshops and classes that people can attend. So um, how do you go about choosing the individual vendors and the individual teachers and workshops to keep it really fresh and exciting every year? Well, I work on the teaching program. I developed that um, with Mika's uh, input as well. And what we're looking for really is a different spread of levels. So we, we tend not to run super beginner classes. We, we tend to skew things towards the, the more advanced knitter because that's our customer. Um, we look for a spread of subjects. So uh, anything that's got cultural interest or is taking a technique and developing it and, you know, adding something to uh, people's a bank of, of techniques that's something we're very keen on yeah. and then there are some sort of special interest classes that that we run so um for example this year we're doing Carrie Westerman is doing a class on knitting and psychogeography I think it's called knitting the landscape and that's about sort of telling stories in your life through stitches and that's just something that is that little bit different really looking forward to that yeah, yeah. but basically there's there's never a class that neither of us would take, if you see what I mean. <laughs> we would love to be able to yeah. do them. We never can. We never have any time. Or yeah. We've never taken a class yet. So, no. um, yeah, mm -hmm. we need to go to, to something else other than yeah. to do that. Basically, how many teachers have you got in, in this year's programme? Um, in this year, we've got 22. So we we focus. we tend to focus on teachers who are in Britain or in Europe... Um, with the odd sprinkling of um, North Americans or, uh, for example, this year, Claire Devine is coming over from Australia. Yeah, great. Okay, and what about the vendors? The vendors, a, a lot of work goes into just creating a very balanced marketplace. I think um, the, what we really focus on is the UK primarily. High quality, luxury goods, that's what we're after for uh, you know, the high-end market, really. So we're not really looking at big brands here. Um, we're looking at small independent producers with really interesting yarns, and we supplement that with um, getting vendors in from a couple from Europe, a couple from the US. They are, people are always interested from all over the world, but we really want to focus on what's available in the UK if we were unlimited in space, we'd love to have more so really interesting, maybe Scandinavian um, suppliers join us. There are some really, really good uh, companies out there. But we try to make it interesting and balanced. And there should be something of interest for all of us. So, for example, um, there's not just, even though there are an awful lot of hand dyers represented, there are also an awful lot of uh, small producers who, who have... Uh, their own runs of yarn. They come up with their own color palettes that are unique to them. They support them by um, patterns that are designed for them and for their yarn. And that's a sort of um, unique product and combination we're really looking for. We're not looking for the stuff that people can readily buy on the internet and it, you know it's not mass produced. We're looking for something with a real story and with a real sort of integrity where things, where patterns have been designed specifically for the yarn and where the vendors who come along can tell a lot about the product, how it's produced, where it comes from. And it just creates a really, um, really, really balanced offer for everyone. So whether you're into speckled hand dyed yarn or the sort of more rustic, single natural, origin, single name origin, the yarn, name the sheep yarn, <laughs> exactly that sort of thing. We want to have a nice balance of tools and accessories, notions and bags. So it's really, uh, it's a constant weighing off. We, when we start taking applications, we start to look what comes in around June and our application process stops in or closes in mid-September. That's what we usually do. And it's incredibly difficult to say no to some really, really, really good people. But we, the way we look at it, we slice it up in almost like a pie with segments. So we cannot have 90% uh, hand dyers, even though there are some really, really amazing hand dyers out there. We would love to have them all. We need to serve other segments of the overall offer as well, if that makes sense. 
absolutely. And I think you do. That's very, very exciting. And it does mean that you get a broader audience too because you've, people have got some very definite tastes as well, don't they? And, and like you said, there's something for do, everybody. Yeah. There, is, there is always something for everybody there as yeah. well. I mean... It's astonishing. <laughs> and the, 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 the biggest challenge is, I guess, and that's the same for the teaching program, we need to, even though the everything comes from a desire to please knitters like ourselves, we also mm -hmm. have to acknowledge that there are a lot of skills, or a lot of products that may not necessarily be exactly for us, but we know that they really appeal to our audience. And that's a difficult balance to strike sometimes when you make a selection for things you can't even though we you know lots of what we offer comes from a place of our own taste and our own desires and our own inspiration we very often say well okay this may not be exactly what we want but mm -hmm. we know it's going to be very very popular just because we haven't sort of an mm -hmm. inkling that an instinct yeah mm -hmm. instinct <laughs> So the social aspect of the festival seems to be a really key element of the success because you've got, um, you've organised various different knit nights, there's the big Friday night party with a Kaylee and a buffet and then there's a very successful podcaster lounge which has now been expanded. You've also got a really big communal area for people to sit and eat and knit and just hang out together. So just talk to us a little bit about the importance of the social aspect. I think it's really key to the, the whole festival, to be honest. Um, if you think about it, knitting is, it, it's something that you do by yourself. It's very solitary. Um, you can, if you want to, keep it solitary. But actually, we know from our own experience, don't we, that um, people getting together and showing off what they can do is a, a massive part of it. And it is really one of the joyful things about the whole festival is um, is watching people who perhaps they've they've had online friendships and they organise meetups. They uh, perhaps they meet you know old friends from different parts of the country and they all come and they they sort of congregate and um, everyone just has a good old nosy. Uh, yeah, it's about what, what you're wearing. Are, I mean, it's, wearing. That, it's yeah. like exactly what, what one thing that's often mm. remarked upon is that the only place where it's uh, appropriate to just <laughs> feel people up in terms of, oh, what's this? It's yes. a yarn festival because there's so much of this going on where people say, oh, tell me about what you're mm. wearing. Tell me about the yarn. Tell me about the pattern. Let me touch it and feel it. And that's, it's a very personal thing and I think people are very happy to talk about it because very often they sit at home with their family who have a vague or no interest in what you do yeah. and, you know, their, their eyes glaze over when you start to talk about your yeah. your, your swatching has gone wrong or you haven't got the right shade or you, you're playing yarn chicken. I, I mean, I think you, you guys yeah. might be in an unusual situation in that you both yeah. you and your husband, love the, yeah. the subject. But, but you know, very, very we're, we're both yeah. living in, in relationships where, you know, yeah. our partners are not interested yeah. in it. I mean, they have an appreciation. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah. my partner, he's got a real appreciation and he... He loves wearing it now. He really appreciates the wool, yeah. but he's not um, uh, He's not sitting here discussing the, the subject with me. No. So, so this yeah. is a, a chance to get together with, yeah. with your people. Yeah, you know. having... That's a really good point. And what you said earlier, Joe, about um, virtual friendships. It is such a great space for people to come and meet physically the friends that they've really got to know over the internet. And a lot of the vendors, when I've spoken to them, that's what they say as well, apart from the excitement of actually being there and being able to show their produce, is that they're able to catch up with all these other friends that they've made, virtual friends. Because we've done this a few times now, we see that there are some people who really they put, need to put their feet up. This is very hard work working an event like that. I mean, it's hard work for us, but if you factor in having to handle goods and doing all of that stuff, it's really hard work. And whereas one portion likes to go home, have a bath and a glass of wine, there's another portion of the vendors who really like to, uh, you know, they love the dancing and they yes. love to come along and have a good <laughs> laugh. And it's really quite, it's, it's just great to see them having such a good time. Yeah. And, uh, being able to catch up yeah. with each other and I think the Kaylee in particular is not the the reason we chose that particular 
activity, if you still want, because we knew we needed a, when we started out, we knew we wanted a party of some sort, but what we didn't want to do is just say, oh yeah, here's your room and we all knit together. And uh, we wanted to add something to that particular event that makes it possible to interact on a different level and make it about something completely different. And the beauty yeah. of Achilles is that you do not need a dancing partner. You do not need to come along with anybody, or even if you're coming along with people, but they don't want to dance. Mm. The dancers are all in formations. They're all made up as you go along. The band will instruct people and it's just a happy chaos ensues yeah. once the music starts playing. And it's just absolutely fantastic to watch. It's fun. It doesn't matter if it doesn't look quite right. It's just really a fantastic it's experience. Great yeah. and, the, and the Scottish cultural element is really just a bonus. It's not... We never chose it for that reason. We thought it'd be a nice thing because it's very much alive. I think lots of sort of um, uh, things like that are, you know... Uh, you mean like Morris dancing? Yeah, exactly. Just for show. It's just for show and it's just a, yeah. for a very specific niche. But Kayleys are really very much alive here. You go to a wedding or a party anywhere in Scotland, you have a Kaylee. That's the thing. Everybody can do it. You, you know, it's part of... Of, of normal life and the band in particular I think that's worth mentioning is as somebody we've seen about 10 years ago or 15 years ago I can't really quite remember they played at, at a friend's 30th birthday in uh, Bridge of Orkey it's my friend uh, Valerie and they played in a tiny village hall and it left such an impression on me this weekend in the middle of nowhere where this fantastic band played that I thought if I ever have an event that requires a Kaylee mm -hmm. band, that's who we're going to call. This is the band. And that's what we did. So, yeah. and they're still, they're, they're now coming for the third yeah. year. A really good bunch, yeah. So there must be so much about the Inbury Yarn Festival that you're both really, really proud of. But what are the really hard challenges that you've had to face together and how are you handling them? There are a lot of challenges throughout the year. And so we're, we're constantly working on small challenges, things that people don't really see behind the scenes. Um, and uh, we know that our visitors, quite rightly, have got really high expectations. So that I guess the biggest challenge is to be constantly meeting expectations, but improving on what we did last year. So we yeah. have to always, I mean, we always look at it and sort of think, this is, the, these are our vendors, our teachers at the top of their game. You know, how do we improve on that? Yeah. And that's quite difficult. Hard to do. <laughs> yeah. That's difficult. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. So we're always looking for just a little bit of glitter or fairy dust to, to sprinkle yeah. on the event. And has it been really hard to handle the growth? Because obviously the more popular the festival becomes, more people want to come. Um, you, you have expanded the social areas. The podcast lounge is also bigger now. The communal area is bigger. Is that a, a major challenge to keep the quality but control the, the, the growth? And, and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of growth, I think the main thing, to say is that our, our focus is always on quality we could very easily just take this event and go to a, a, a massive airport hangar next out, on the outskirts of town but it would change the atmosphere so whatever we do in terms of expansion of space had to be within keeping of what the general look and feel is of the event and the atmosphere so this year we are we're building a, a beautiful marquee with mm -hmm. nice lighting and we are just extending the social area so just so we have i think we're going to have about 500 more seats there are going to be 800 seats in total just to socialize which is very unusual for an event of this type because space is at a premium it's very expensive and you know for us it does an investment in our in the happiness of our visitors if you so want because they have a certain expectation that it's not just a shopping event or popping in and popping out uh people come as an experience for a whole weekend they meet yeah. friends they want to have time um to socialize with people yeah in comfort and with that good lighting. takes space you yeah know, that, that takes space, takes space and it takes moving people around yeah. a venue and keeping you know keeping areas for this and areas for that yeah. and so yeah there are yeah. a lot of a lot Lots of nitty-gritty yeah. challenges yeah. which are... and podcasting in particular i mean you you just uh, touched on that it's a uh, when we first did this event in the corn exchange we had this idea about the podcast lounge because we realized 
that there were a couple of our friends who started doing this and we thought, hey, this is great. This is a really interesting thing and nobody's doing that. Why don't we provide a space? Because we know that some listeners started to say, I would like to meet the person who's podcast I'm I'm watching or listening to and that's not an area that's incredibly popular because a lot of knitters are really quite introvert I think they're not necessarily very very outgoing but they love coming and meeting the people who provide inspirational content and get the chance to either just see them in real life or maybe even talk to them so mm -hmm. I think it's a really exciting prospect for people to to have that and also for podcasts amongst themselves we get that feedback a lot we get a lot of uh, requests to join we have a limited amount of passes we issue as in sort of official podcasters but there's an incredible amount of interest because there's so much I guess so much going on it's very appealing for a podcaster mm. hopefully to come be able to meet the audience and well, that's also, it meeting the yeah, audience meeting well. the audience that's, yeah. that's a great thing Yeah. Well, definitely. <laughs> I'll be very excited to meet people and, and yeah, it's a fantastic opportunity and, and area. So as a podcaster, thank you very much <laughs> for providing we're looking, forward space. To, we're looking forward to seeing you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've just got one last question and that is, I know you're always working um, at the highest quality that you can. So when I say to you, what's your vision for the Edinburgh Yarn Festival in the future? Um, I imagine the answer is along the lines of keep doing it as high a quality as we can. But are You're there right. anything else that is there anything else exciting? Maybe some plans or something for 2019 that you can share with us. A month off. <laughs> yeah, no, at the moment <laughs> we always. Happen. I mean, we plan ahead uh, a long time, so we all already start to look ahead to 2019. But there are so many moving parts to this that we. Uh, these sort of things only tend to materialize in sort of the couple of weeks after. We're also working on a book, um, yeah. which is a kind of a, a journey around Scotland, um, talking about and meeting the people who actually raise the sheep and spin the wool yeah. and um, really give you know, an extra layer to the yarn festival yeah. as well, don't they? A lot yeah, and I think that's some, it's an added added mm. thing to the yarn festival, hopefully. We we're planning to publish this in autumn, but it may well be next year for the yarn festival. But mm. it's all about, because those of people who come to the yarn festival now, they don't just come for a couple of days or even a day. Very often they come for a week and they want to explore what's behind or what's beyond the yarn festival, mm -hmm. what's on offer in Scotland. And we've through the work we've done in the last few years, we've met so many really interesting people and we get asked a lot from visiting designers or from just our audience. Mm. Uh, I'm, I've got this time in December or in September or in August. What should I do? This is where I'm going. What should I prioritize? And we just thought, we, we always answer these emails and we always say, yeah, but we, we can no longer do it. So we said, right, we're going to put this in a book. Everything yeah. we know about this country and the interesting wool destinations. We're going to put this together and hopefully that's going to enhance the Edinburgh Young Festival experience as well. Yeah. I think it's a brilliant idea, the Scottish Fibre Trail. I think, I think it's fantastic. Okay, well, look, thank you so much for spending time with us. I know you are both are so incredibly busy. The viewers won't know this, but this is pre-Edinburgh Yarn Festival. They'll, they'll see this after. So um, I'm really excited to come over next week and partake in the events and, and hopefully meet you. And so thank you um, from, from me and from our viewers for putting on such a brilliant show. Thank you. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll say goodbye to the audience. Bye. 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 Welcome back. Before we go any further, I am going to mention I have been wearing my Paris's scarf by Nancy Marchand. It is really beautiful. This is my most recent finished object, I think, Dals. Yes, it is. Um, but I am going to take it off now because it's, it's quite hot. warm. Yeah. There's a bit of sunshine in Frankfurt today in it's Offenbach. Beautiful. Yep. So we want to talk about uh, the two cows that we have running right now. It's the Modify Your Garment Carl. Uh, we started that at the beginning of February. And the idea of that Carl is that you 
modify a garment, pick a garment and modify it in any way you want to suit yourself better. And we wanted to create a forum where new knitters could have a go at modifying their garment alongside experienced knitters who can share their wisdom. And of course, there's always lots of different body types and style preferences. So just reading through and participating, you're bound to learn a lot. So we thought there's a lot of great projects in there. There's a lot of really good modifications happening and we thought it would be fun just to take a couple of the projects and yeah, talk about them a bit and, and show you what's going on to encourage you to join in or keep going if you're sort of finding it a, a bit hard at the moment. <laughs> so first up we have Tamara who's Tamara La on Ravelry. Tamara has finished her garment already and she took Marie Wallen's muckle row sweater and turned it into a cardigan. She used another yarn so she probably had to alter the gauge and she also knitted it top down instead of bottom up and she changed some of the motifs. And I just think it's really interesting to be able to change a sweater to a cardigan or a cardigan to a sweater. That's a really good modification skill. Sounds like a have. good exercise to go through. Yeah, to me. definitely. Another example from this, Carl, is Nikki, who is Blue Nut on Ravelry. Nikki's a fellow Australian and she's doing Telgia by Jennifer Steingas. Nikki is modifying the sleeves and the body shaping to fit her figure better. And she's knitting at a different gauge than the patterns gauge. But what's really interesting is that she's greatly lowering the neckline by using short rows. The pattern already has short row shaping to raise the back of the neck, but Nikki's doing it a lot more. She's adding around 10 rows of short row shaping, and she's starting the short row shaping below the yoke with arms joined together with the body. That's really interesting to read about on her project page. She's also arranged the stitches on her yoke so that there's more stitches in the front of the yoke then the back of the yoke, and that's to accommodate her, her bust measurements. Yep. The other cowl that we have is the Vintage Shetland Cowl, where you can knit any of the designs from Susan Crawford's latest book, The Vintage Shetland Project. Um, there are already some really stunning projects or um, designs coming up in yeah. that thread, so we thought we'd take a look at a couple of them. Yeah, we've got three of them that I want to point out to you. First off is Julie, who is Crochet Julie on Ravelry, and Julie is doing the beautiful roses cardigan, which is really typical of the 50s. The body's knitted in the round, bottom up, and so are the sleeves. Then the sleeves are joined to the body, and it is a really unusual construction because the top half is constructed partly like a yoke and partly like set in sleeves. Julie said that she found it challenging at first, but I think she's doing a fantastic job. So. Keep going, Julie, it's looking really great. Then we've got Hannah, who is HMW on Ravelry, and she's knitting the Tate hat. Susan describes the construction of this hat in our interview back in episode 48, and it's really unusual. You first knit the ferrule bands, and then you pick up stitches along each of the bands and knit the plain sections on the bias. That's really interesting. And Hannah's done a beautiful job of this. Her knitting looks super neat. So I think it's going to be really great to see it finished and, and to see yeah, Hannah knitting that, that it and wearing really, it. Yeah, it's yeah. a really interesting design, that one. Um, finally, we have Julie, who is Aniko on Ravelry, and she's knitting the gorgeous Vela cardigan. The construction of this cardigan is, in contrast to the other two, quite straightforward. It's a um, steaked, you know, knitted in the round and steaked. Um, so fairly typical construction. The colours are really vintage Shetland if you look at it. Julie has changed her background colour to a natural light shade instead of the brown and that also looks really good. I think that was a stash driven modification um, which I think is a really good thing to do too. Um, Julie's nearly up to the armholes but she has decided to give it a soak and a, a block before she goes any further and I think it's all looking good. So good luck with that Julie. We're also keen to see the progress on that. Susan Crawford has offered Fruity Knitting patrons a discount on any vintage Shetland project kit um, that yarn you purchased. Kit, yeah. The yarn kit, yeah. If you purchase that in her online shop. So these yarns have been specifically developed to reproduce the original vintage style, so they're really suited to the projects in the book. Susan has extended the duration of that discount up to the end of April so that you have got a chance to get the book and to select the projects before selecting your yarn. So check that out. We'll have the details on Patreon and also links in the program notes. So I hope that's whetted your appetite and you want to join in if you haven't already or if you're feeling a little bit slow that you're motivated now to keep going because they're two really great cows. The Modify Your Garment Carl goes to the end of 
June and the Vintage Shetland project, Carl, goes to the end of July. But we will gladly extend the date of the Vintage Shetland yep. um, project, Carl, until, particularly if there's um, a lot more people joining in. Yep. Yeah, we'll watch the thread. Yep. Yeah. So it is now time for us to take a hike in the Odenwald. We're going to be visiting... Yes. Breuberg Castle, which is this beautifully preserved castle from the 13th century. Um, just so that you know, the accompanying music that we're going to have is John Eccles' violin sonata in G minor. John Eccles is an interesting guy. He was an English composer. He had the position of master of the king's music, mm. and he was given this position by King William III, but he actually kept it and also served for Queen Anne and then Queen King George I and then King George II which makes you think that being a musician was a more stable career than being a king. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a, it was an extremely long time that he held that very important position. Yeah. So enjoy the music and enjoy seeing the castle. Yeah. We'll see you soon. back. We hope you enjoyed that footage of Castle Breuberg. We had such a beautiful sunny day to film that Stunning on. It day. was great. Yeah. So we're nearly up to our second feature interview, but first we really want to thank our wonderful patrons for your ongoing financial support. We also want to ask our viewers to please contribute financially to the production of this show. 
If you find it enjoyable and valuable, producing the content of this show so regularly is way more than a full-time job. Well over 50 hours per week, every single week, goes into the production of this show. And it's only sustainable if we get enough financial support. So if it's important for you to see the show keep going, then please support it by becoming a patron. Thank you. Just a quick reminder that we do have our next Fruity Knitting Live event coming up on Friday the 13th of April. Our guest this time is Isabel Kramer, which is really exciting. Make sure you get your questions in so that we can talk about that. It's going to be a really fun event. Yeah, she's very special. We are ready now for our interview with Kate Athley, our second feature interview for the episode. Um, Kate is, has many strings to her bow. She is editor of the online magazine Nitty.com. She's a designer herself. She has written many books. She teaches. Um, and as Andrea mentioned earlier in the show, um, Kate has a particular passion or a particular dedication to sock knitting, but also to the production of really high quality knitting patterns. And exactly. her two books reflect yes, that. they do. And I just want to interrupt because yeah. she has... Um, offered all Fruity Knitting patrons a discount on um, all of her patterns in Ravelry. So patrons, go and check that out and you'll get to have some fantastically well-written sock patterns and other patterns as well. That's right. You can find the details at patreon.com slash Fruity Knitting. So that's the show for today. The interview is coming up. Thank you very much for being with us today and we'll see you in two weeks' time. Yes. Bye. Bye. Fruity Knitting Podcast. Today's guest is Kate Atherley. Kate is Nitty's lead technical editor. She regularly contributes to knitting books and magazines and she's written some very successful knitting books herself. Kate's passion is sock knitting and her custom socks book describes how to really make the perfect fitting sock. Another popular book is her Pattern Writing for Knit Designers, which was written to help knit designers create high quality knitting patterns. So Kate's going to talk in depth about both those subjects today. And I think if you've been put off sock knitting through bad experiences, you're probably going to be right on track and feeling really confident again by the end of the interview. So Kate, welcome to the podcast. It's really great to have you on the show and to hear some of your expertise. Thanks. I'm very pleased to be here. Good. So, Kate, can we start off talking about how your early education and work experience has just helped you prepare and create a career in the knitting industry? Absolutely. So, from an education perspective, I have a degree in pure mathematics, and it's incredibly relevant to knitting. Obviously, there's mathematics in all of aspects of designing and in all aspects of technical editing. But also, after I finished university, I uh, worked for a few years in software. And I was always working for organizations that had very complicated technical systems. There was a mathematical programming language. There was a system that dealt with document management and archival regulations for legal and government. Not very interesting, but... Uh, and a system that uh, handled digital rights management for MP3 and video assets. And what these systems had in common was that they were complicated and that they were built by experts, but used by non-subject matter experts. And all of this is hugely relevant to knitting because that's what knitting patterns are. They're instructions from experts to non-experts. And when I say expert, I'm not talking necessarily about knitting level, but when a a pattern is designed by someone who understands the pattern intimately, they need to be able to communicate instructions to the user, the knitter, so the knitter can replicate what the designer has done. Yeah. And you also do a lot of teaching, don't you? So you would have heard a lot of questions from knitters and you'd be really aware of um, where the problem areas are and where they get really stuck. So how has that influenced the way you've been writing your own patterns and how you've been tech editing? 
You know what? The teaching for me is everything. I began teaching as sort of a fun sideline for me as a way to share my love of knitting. But it really started to drive my own designing and pattern writing and then ultimately books and teaching, other teaching as well, because of what I saw in those classes. The class that I have taught the most often, the first one I really started teaching 15 years ago now, is a project workshop. And it's an unfocused class in that people bring whatever they're working on and I help them with it. And the idea is that students bring something that's a challenge, whether it's a technical challenge, their first sock, for example, or a pattern reading challenge or some other aspect. And the questions that I fielded in that class have informed everything about what I do, I think, because there are really two types of questions that come up in knitting. Um, there are technique related questions, of course, you know, for example, how do I do the long tail cast on? Or how do you remember which one is make one right and which one is make one left and get them right? And those are easy. Those are quite straightforward. You can look those up. But the types of questions that uh, we ran into more often and the ones that really sort of intrigued me were the pattern reading questions, the instruction reading questions. Um, I, you know, I had a student in my class and she was a remarkably new knitter. She'd sort of learned the basics. She could cast on, she could cast off, she could knit and she could purl. And she had her heart set on a cabled baby jacket for the baby she was expecting. She'd never cabled before in her life, but because the instructions were written incredibly well, she was able to cable. Because if you think about the instructions, it really says all you need if they're written well. Slip two stitches to a cable needle, hold them in the front of your work, knit, you know, you know how a cable goes. With sufficient information, a knitter of really even the most rudimentary skill level can execute. But what I saw was instructions that weren't complete and they weren't helping the knitter. And they weren't addressing the knitter either, and they weren't playing fair. One of the biggest challenges that I see people run into is a, a pattern that isn't written for them. Because it's perfectly okay in a knitting pattern to use something like reversing shapings, but it does require a degree of experience and a degree of confidence on the part of the knitter. And if you're not letting the knitter know what you expect of them in the pattern itself, then a knitter isn't necessarily going to be able to be successful with that. That's true. And I think a lot of that came about because of publishing in books and trying to keep it to minimum space, doesn't it? Now that we can um, publish on Ravelry, you can have it as long as you like. But even again, there, there's a, a balance, isn't there, between... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And one of, the, one of my little sort of crusades, if you will, that has come out of teaching is specifically around the SSK decrease. And this is a really interesting lesson that I learned in my classes and has motivated me. And it motivated me to write my pattern writing book. The decrease SSK is so often described, so often defined as slip, slip, knit. If you look it up in a pattern glossary, I'm amazed at how often that's provided as the instruction. That's it, no other words. Um, I had a beginning knitter in my class and she asked me what to do with this decrease. She'd looked it up. The instruction said slip, slip, knit. So that's what she did. It's not a decrease. You slip a first stitch, slip a second stitch. I mean, leaving aside the question of it may or may not be clear how you slip and then knit a third stitch. And watching a knitter go through that sparked so much for me because I realize we're doing them a disservice by not providing sufficient information. And so we, ha we have to remember when we're writing the instructions, we have to think about what people know, what knowledge they have, and how to go about executing these things. And so, you know, if I could change one thing in the knitting world, <laughs> it would be that we stop referring to that decrease as slip, slip, knit. Not sure that's ever going to happen, but that's my ambition. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I'd like to talk now about your um, custom socks book, which you published in the 20, in 2015. It was very successful. It was um, 
So it's called Custom Socks Knit to Fit Your Feet. But there have actually been quite a lot of uh, knitting books written on socks. So what did you think was missing in the general sock knitting literature that prompted you to write a book on socks? As the title says, it really is all about fit for me. I started knitting socks a good mm, 20 years ago, um, before the internet was really a factor in knitting. And my knitting mentor, my grandmother at that point, had, had gone and I was pretty much on my own. So I wanted to learn to knit socks, I picked up a book. The book was full of gorgeous sock patterns and I decided to knit my way through it. They're all different sorts of styles. And I was five pairs into it before I realized that the problem I was having wasn't my fault. What was happening was the socks weren't fitting me. The first pair fell off my feet. The second pair, slightly better size, but still I couldn't get my shoes on over them. None of the socks fitted me, they were all too big. The problem wasn't with me, the problem was with the book. The socks were all sized for a woman's medium foot, which I'm not, I'm little, I'm not very tall, I've got quite small feet, they're sort of a European 36, and smaller than average. This is where my math degree came in handy. I was able to sort out how to resize those particular patterns to fit me and happily start knitting socks. But when I started knitting and teaching knitting, I realized that I wasn't the only one having this issue. Not everybody has a woman's medium foot. You know? And the more I dug into it, the more I realized that this was a problem that other people had and lots of other people had. And there are books out there that deal with fit, uh, but they so often focus on foot length, which for me is a puzzlement, because really foot length when you're knitting a sock, I mean, we're talking here about conventionally constructed top down or toe up socks. Foot length is really just a case of you knit more or less in the foot. Yeah. The key measurement for a foot for a sock knitting is foot circumference. And so many books just seem to gloss over that. There are lots of books out there that offer one size, 64 stitches, for example. And no matter how long or short you knit the foot, that 64 stitches is not going to work for everybody. In the summer of 2011, I kicked off a, pun intended, a foot size survey. I gathered measurements for 500 adult feet from all different places, all different ages of adult, and a, a, you know, obviously a good representation across genders as well. And I learned some very interesting things. First of all, between a woman's sort of the smallest average foot, you know, a, a, a sort of a European 35, a, a North American kind of five, and uh, the largest end of the woman's feet, a North American sort of 12, uh, you know, or perhaps a 40 or a 42 in that range. There's about a 30% difference in foot length, but also foot circumference. And the idea that one or, or even two sizes of sock could stretch to fit that range of feet equally comfortably, to me, it seems ridiculous. It just, it's not going to happen. The socks look better, fit better, and wear better if they're properly fitted. And yeah. so my book is all about those. So I crunched the numbers on the foot size survey, learned a few interesting things. One of which is about asymmetry. If you measured your feet lately, both of them, by the way, and it amazes me, I include myself in this, how many sock knitters haven't measured both their feet in a sufficient degree of detail. There's a symmetry in the average adult foot, and that is that your ankle circumference and your foot circumference are usually pretty close. But most sock knitters know this. They just don't know that they know this. If you think about your favorite sock pattern, if you're a sock knitter, you probably have a vanilla sock pattern you use. And think about the number of stitches for the foot and the number of stitches for the leg. It's the same, typically. Yeah. For me, it's 56 yeah. stitches, right? It's not because that's required for sock architecture or because the pattern wouldn't work out without it. We do that because your foot and your ankle are usually the same. But if they're not, you need to adjust. And so there's an instant possibility for customization there. 
And there's also these foot size survey that crunching that data as well confirmed a second aspect of sock fit to me as well, which is why I was struggling so much with a short row heel. The average foot is significantly like 15 to 20 percent larger around the front of heel circumference. If you think about just in front of where your heel is, the circumference around the arch of your foot, if you will. And so a short row heel sock in its standard form doesn't add any extra fabric in that point. So of course they're not going to fit. You know, if they're going to they fit you around your heel, they don't fit around the rest of your foot. If they fit you around your toes, they're not going to fit you around your heel. And so crunching this data really confirmed for me what sort of anecdotally I'd understood about sock fit and what I came out with was a whole bunch of sort of understanding of feet shape of sock fit and some simple rules for you to determine what sock fit needs you have and so my book has two master patterns a toe up and a top down and they are constructed around the average foot measurements, and I know what the average foot measurements and the average foot shape is now. And, and each of these is, comes in nine sizes, sorry, nine gauges and 12 sizes. And then what I've done is some, provided some simple rules for determining if you've got a special fit need and how to adjust the patterns if you do. Gosh. There, are, yeah, <laughs> there are some patterns as well, you know, some cable socks and some lace socks and some textured socks. And most of the patterns come in both toe up and top down versions because people have a preference that way. And the book also has lots of tips and techniques too, things like, you know, uh, avoiding gusset holes and how to work with different needle configurations. And so, you know, it is about fit, but there's a lot of other sock wisdom in there too, I think. Yeah, well, that sounds really interesting. I know from experience in buying shoes that my right foot is definitely bigger than my left, and I think that's the case for a lot of people. You've also, your latest book is about knitting mittens and gloves, and that's called Knit Mitts, Your Handy Guide to Knitting Mittens and Gloves. So are we expecting to find similar help on fit for hands as well? There's definitely some uh, discussion of fit for hands. Uh, the fit requirements are a little less persnickety for a mitten because we tend to wear them looser. But I do still have those master templates. So I have a master mitten pattern in 13 sizes and 13 gauges. So I cover kids as well. And lots of customization options. So flip tops and fingerless and gloves as well. And because I do live in Canada and it is pretty cold here, there's a, there's a deep discussion of yarn choice and fibers for warmth, whether you wear animal fibers or not, strategies for lining and strategies for adding an extra warmth through, fa through fabric choices and pattern stitches and that kind of thing, because that becomes key with making mittens. And of course, lots of tips and tricks. And uh, it's not about gusset holes with mittens, it's about the pesky hole at the base of the thumb. So I have a solution for that too. Okay, so that sounds good. So there is one other book that I want to talk about, um, and that's The Beginner's Guide to Writing Knitting Patterns. And you also teach a class on writing patterns, which I'll be taking with you at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival. So can you tell us who is this uh, class and book aimed at and what are they going to be learning from it? It's aimed at people who are writing instructions. So it, you might be a designer, but also knitting teachers as well find this useful. It's really for anyone who has to communicate to knitters. In uh, the global world of knitting, and you yourself mentioned that, you know, we're not publishing in paper anymore, we're publishing online, we're publishing for digital audiences, and we're publishing for much broader audiences too. I'm not just writing a pattern for someone who, you know, it lives in the same town as me. I'm not just publishing for patterns patterns for people who speak the same language as me. I have to think about how to make sure my patterns are accessible to knitters of all skill levels. And the context is interesting to me too, because if you have a class full of knitters who've all learnt to cast on from, for example, the same teacher, if you say cast on in the usual manner, then you know what you're going to get. But if I publish in a pattern, ah, cast on loosely in your usual manner and send that out into the world, then you're going to get a lot of different types of cast ons and you're going to get people who may or may not know what's required to be successful with that. If a knitter is not successful, if they don't enjoy it, if they're not happy, they may walk away from the project. They may stop knitting socks. or And that's the best case. 
The worst case is they may stop knitting entirely. And so for me, it's about making sure that people are successful so that they keep knitting. They keep buying patterns, they keep buying yarn, they keep attending classes, they keep buying books. Really, we need people to be successful so that the industry stays alive and stays healthy. Yes, because before it was very much something, maybe 50 years ago, it was something that people did from necessity. It was, it, it was cheaper to knit your own garment rather than buy it. But now it is actually quite a luxury to be knitting in, in our first world countries. So yeah, it is very much about having a good time and a good experience. And that's my objective. That's what I want. I want people you know, to be able to use the patterns and people to be successful with what they knit and love it and wear it, you know. Kate, thank you so much for spending time with us. It's been really good and really informative, so we appreciate it. Excellent, thank you. So we'll say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye-bye, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>